Welcome everyone to the Center for the Women of New York presents uh, Sustainability. In collaboration with New York City Parks. I'm Victoria Pilati, the Center for the, President for the, of the Center for the Women of New York and Scotia Hill, our green team coordinator and social media specialist volunteer uh, could not be with us right now but uh, she put a lot of work into this and it's really her passion. So we thank Scotia. So good morning everyone and welcome to CWNY sustainability webinar. If you missed our previous webinars and would like to view them, please visit cwny.org slash past hyphen events slash. And do subscribe to our newsletter on our uh, homepage of our website, cwny.org. Since our founding in 1987, the center has shown that women working together can be an effective force. We are a voluntary nonprofit organization dependent on dues from our members and on the volunteer efforts of business, professional, and community women and men in New York City. At the Center for the Women of New York, we believe education is the cornerstone of women's economic independence. We advocate strongly for women's full equality by partnering with like-minded organizations and elected officials. Whether we're marching for worthy causes, celebrating women's accomplishments in leadership, the arts or sports, camaraderie is a hallmark of CWNY. We've come a long way since the second wave of the women's movement in the latter half of the 20th century. And while there are many struggles ahead, we celebrate how far we've come. So a copy of these slides will be made available at the link below after the presentation, cwny.org slash past hyphen events. Our panelists today are Catherine Bielen and Jennifer Greenfeld. Your questions will be addressed after all panelists have presented. Use the chat box at the bottom of your Zoom meeting screen to ask a question. If you dialed in, email your questions to events at cwny.org. And a little bit about Catherine Bielen. Catherine is a development financier specializing in the nexus between finance, climate resiliency, and women. After working as a banker in the U.S. for Brown Brothers Harriman and in Luxembourg for the European Investment Bank, Catherine transitioned to UNDP, where her most recent project is the Spotlight Initiative, a USD 500 million project to combat violence against women. Catherine is also social impact producer of a feature length documentary titled Warrior Women of Football, a film about gender inequality in professional soccer. And now let me introduce Jennifer Greenfeld, Assistant Commissioner of Forestry, Horticulture and Natural Resources. Jennifer manages the department's nature portfolio, including over 600,000 street trees, 150,000 park trees, and 10,000 acres of natural areas. Over the last 23 years at parks, Jennifer led critical efforts to study the health of street trees and to quantify the impact of trees on the urban environment. Uh, 
She played an important role in Million Trees, New York City, and has overseen the restoration and management of 2,000 of acres of natural areas. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you, Victoria. Um, I'm so thrilled to talk uh, to this group. Um, it's very exciting to get a chance to talk about what I do to a new audience. So, it's, um, uh, Victoria, can you just let me know if you can see my screen okay? I can. That's great. All right. So I'm going to talk about nature in New York City. Um, and um, and uh, I will all right, uh, be first kind of giving you a bit of a tour to show you what nature looks like in New York City. These are two baby um, night crowned herons. And um, uh, why nature is important. Uh, it's not always the first thing people think about in New York. How we at Parks care for the nature that's in New York City, how you can learn more and what you can do. Because um, I know this is a very action oriented group. So uh, I'll just hop right in and show you two views of Manhattan. They're views I'm sure you've seen before. Um, one from the north, one from the south. Uh, the one from the north is, uh, from the south is, is what people think of when they think of New York City buildings, skyscrapers, um, business. Uh, but if you just look on the northern end of Manhattan, you'll see uh, this, you'll see a lot of green space. This is um, in the foreground is Inwood Hill Park. And it's got some of the oldest trees in the city. They were last cut in the Revolutionary War time when mercenary Hessians were occupying Manhattan. And, um, uh, and since then, it's been left to grow. And uh, so even in Manhattan, and this is just off the A train, we have some pretty fabulous uh, natural areas in New York City. And so I'll take you a little bit on a, 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 a little bit of a tour, uh, starting at the very north. Um, this is Pelham Bay Park in the Bronx. Um, and what's so great about the natural areas in New York is that um, we sit in this sort of confluence of a lot of different ecosystems from the uh, sort of southern New England, rocky coastline is what you see in the Bronx, down to the mid-Atlantic, and we're going to end our tour in the southern part of Staten Island. Uh, and that means that there's a lot of diversity, a lot of diversity in sort of ecosystems and species, because there's this different kinds of um, ecosystems and uh, sort of natural features, and also this combination of fresh water from the Hudson River and uh, salt water, so it really attracts a great diversity. So then we'll take you down the Bronx River, um, free-flowing natural river in New York City, uh, to Van Cortlandt Park, one of the largest parks, Pelham Bay Park is actually the largest park in New York City. Um, really some healthy, beautiful forests here. Down to Inwood in the winter, a different view. Uh, Cunningham Park in Queens, um, going now further south. Uh, we'll see some um, salt marshes uh, along Bush Terminal in Brooklyn with where you get some pretty phenomenal city views. And then keep going down south to Wolf Pond Park in Staten Island and finishing our tour the southernmost point of New York State, in fact, not just New York City, which is Conference House Park in Staten Island. And um, the natural areas are really varied here. This is a lot of very unusual scrub, shrub of sort of coastal forest. So as, as you can tell from the pictures that I've, I've um, shared with you that New York City isn't just built, only 40% of it, 60% is natural in some way, whether it's what you think of as a natural area or it could be the landscaped area of the um, sort of formal areas. It could be parks or cemeteries or backyards. That's about that 29%. And the natural areas, again, you might think of as um, forests or grasslands or um, wetlands like salt marshes, rivers, uh, freshwater wetlands. So it gives you an idea of nature in New York City, but really when you compare it to all the different competing, uh, sort of competing, I would say, uh, needs and um, demands on space and real estate in New York, it better be pretty important uh, for us to be managing it and protecting it. And you can quantify benefits for New York City parks. Uh, for, this is a way of quantifying benefits in dollars, you know, pollution removal, avoided runoff from rains, um, annual carbon sequestration and storage. So you have dollar values of the canopy, for example. Um, you have very specific uh, um, 
ways it addresses climate change in terms of not just removing air pollution, but um, reducing local air temperatures. And extreme heat kills more people than many other um, sort of extreme weather uh, um, events uh, combined. So it's really important in a lot of different ways. Uh, when you think about wetlands, so the other part of the natural areas, they provide a some um, benefits in terms of storm surge, flood protection, habitat and biodiversity, protecting our water quality and providing access and re re recreation. So, you know, what's so critical about New York, it is, it's not just that, it's in this really interesting confluence of different ecosystems and, you know, it's on the Atlantic Flyway, so it gathers a lot of birds that need, a re need rest, but it's in close proximity to over 8 million people. So I, I always think like if you, if you do have, um, of some connection to or caring for nature in areas outside of the city, what be better way to protect them to make sure people in the city also care about it and they have experience with nature. So um, the Parks Department has a huge responsibility when it, when it comes to these um, pieces that I was just describing. We manage half of all the natural areas that sort of sliver of 11%. And we um, manage about 12% of all these landscapes is sort of almost 30% of the um, land area in New York City and half of all the trees, no matter where they grow. And so we take that responsibility extremely seriously. So I'll just talk about a few ways that we do that. Um, when I talk about trees in New York City or New York City parks as urban forests, I put them into three different buckets. One are the trees that grow along the street. The second one are the trees in the forest, these natural areas. And the third one is sort of everything in between the trees that we manage in kind of landscaped or active areas of parks. Uh, and when I talk about wetlands, Again, it's about half of everything that is in New York City. Um, the rest of it is, um, a lot of it is under the jurisdiction of the National Park Service, so it is protected. Uh, but, um, but I do talk about salt marshes, freshwater wetlands, and streams. So we do a lot to protect these natural areas. Um, we do a, a host of different approaches to restoration. This is an example of how we look at our um, natural area forests. We uh, manage invasive species, and then we plant. Uh, so we do this both on extremely disturbed sites, but also on sites that may have a great canopy layer, but don't have young trees growing up to replace them as they age. Um, in salt marshes, again, we have a host of different uh, restoration approaches. One is to actually restore salt marshes by taking out fill from areas that were historically salt marshes, but used as dumping grounds for years. And once you take out that fill, um, it, it, the hydrology sort of, and planted appropriately, the hydrology just sort of takes over and the salt marsh restores. I wouldn't say it restores itself, it definitely takes caring, but that's an example of some of the things we've done in terms of freshwater um, restoration. We, for example, um, created this fish passage, which is kind of a little ladder where um, eel, not eel, sorry, alewife, a uh, kind of herring, travels up this ladder to get over this dam in the Bronx River. And these are fish that travel from northern Canada to come back. They find their way back to the Bronx River to spawn. And they provide a huge amount of, they're very low on the, um, on sort of the, the uh, what's it called, the um, uh, food chain. So they provide a lot of uh, food for birds that are flying through and a lot of other animals. So it's really important that we provide additional habitat. So this way they get access to acres and acres of habitat upstream. We have conservation monitoring compliance programs uh, that look at uh, the little baby terrapin, uh, it's a protected turtle, uh, monitor a host of different things, including potentially eroding salt marshes. That's what that picture is. And then we also look at um, where our plant material comes from as we're doing restoration. We have an amazing place in Staten Island, the Greenbelt Native Plant Center that collects seed responsibly from the local area and stores it for future use, like very much future use in seed banks, sort of Noah's arcs of seed, but also use some of it to propagate and grow our own plant material so we have the appropriate native plant composition when we do restoration work. And we also study, uh, we have a great partnership with the natural, with um, uh, the US, United States Forest Service, uh, a house in Fort Totten, um, not far from your new headquarters, uh, where we have a residential space. So researchers, we can make it easy and affordable for researchers to come study nature in New York City and the laboratory and meeting spaces. So 
that's a little bit about what nature is, how we take care of it. And I wanted to offer you some ways that um, uh, you can learn more since this is a, a brief talk. I ran through things very quickly. Uh, you can learn more. You can go online. Our partners at the Natural Areas Conservancy took a lot of our data and work that they've done, and they've, they they um, have uh, put it in a beautiful series of maps that are interactive where you can click on different sort of icons, parks anywhere around the city and understand the natural areas, wetlands, forests, what we've restored, um, what we're working on now. Uh, then you can also learn more about our street trees, which I didn't talk about very much in this talk, but there's, uh, we count every street tree every 10 years. We've done it three times now. Maybe some of you participated because we, we worked with volunteers to complete this. Uh, and we have this beautiful report online where you can really learn, dig deep into the street tree population and how it's changed over the last 20 years. Uh, and this is our increased numbers of street trees over, over time. Uh, and then if you really want to go crazy with maps, all of the trees, the, the trees along the street that are under parks jurisdiction that we manage are, <clears throat> are then are, are shown on this public interactive uh, tree map. So you just Google NYC trees, tree map, you'll probably get this. And you literally can click on any of these dots, uh, look up your address, learn more about the tree. It'll give you its ecological benefits. You can favorite it and you can, um, uh, and you uh, uh, learn about it and you can record care if you've learned how to take care of it. So that is um, one of the next things I'm going to get to is talking about if you want to do even more than learning about it, how you can participate and help us protect New York City's nature. One of the easiest things is sign uh, the, the, um, the declaration uh, to nature in New York City. So there's a part of New York City Nature Goals 2050. You can go online and take a look at that. And there's a declaration, again, that you can sign that basically is explaining how all New Yorkers have a right to great nature. And by adding your name to this, you're showing support for the protection and management of nature in New York City. So I'm, I'm starting from the real easy stuff where you don't have to leave your house. Um, this is maybe one step further. You can follow the Natural Areas Conservancy, one of our nonprofit partners. You can attend their events for free or you can join them to support them. So donating money is also always a way to show your support. Uh, you can get up out of your couch. It's a safe place to get into the parks and, uh, and experience nature. To me, that's, that's the best way to get a sense of, of what it does, how it changes you, um, when you walk through it, the peace of mind, the quiet, um, and not so quiet when there are birds and other families enjoying the, the parks. These um, parks listed here have really well-designed trail systems that are marked and where you can get um, good trail maps online. Uh, and then finally, you can actually do something in the park. You can volunteer. We have a great stewardship program online. There are, we're back in business after COVID, and we uh, um, have a lot of events over the next couple of I would say month or two through November, uh, where we'll be planting trees. We have limited sizes, so um, they'll fill up. We can't have more than 25 plus people at an event. So I, I hope to see you there sometime soon. And, um, and if you have your own yard, you can take some of the things you've learned from this talk today, uh, from things you might look up at online, and you can plant native species in your own yard. And we have a great guide online uh, to give you an idea of what of what you should be planting and what you shouldn't be planting, which might even be easier sometimes. And this will help support pollinators and flowers and agriculture all over, um, not just in New York City, but, but even outside of it. So thanks for uh, giving me a few moments of your time uh, to share what I do um, and um, uh, how you can help participate in uh, caring for and managing New York City. Thank you, Jennifer. That was a very comprehensive presentation on the natural habitats in right here in the five boroughs. And so now it is time for the Q&A session. And um, we are re-recording this. What happened? Uh, only parts of our original webinar uh, were saved uh, in a recording. OK, 
Okay, I have my questions. So, Jennifer, what do you think prevents more women from getting involved in conservation work? Um, well, it's a good question. I think there's an assumption there that women aren't getting involved in conservation work. And I think, um, you know, my experience is very mixed. I have sometimes some fabulous um, women candidates. I have almost 200 people on my staff. Um, we're pretty well distributed in some areas, but some of the more hardier physical work is a little bit less, um, less often attracts women. So I think um, I would say maybe it's two things. One is kind of a, a fear or a sense that perhaps we aren't able to do the physical work in the field, the actual, you know, cutting and pulling and pruning and treating. Um, but it's not always sort of demands significant physical, um, like sort of strength. Uh, you need to be in good shape, but you don't need to be particularly big or strong to be successful at that. So you have to get over that sense of, you know, perhaps if women are not seeing themselves as physically strong, but so many of us are still in excellent shape. Uh, doesn't mean we can't do what some of these men are doing in the field. And then I think there's just sort of a traditional um, sort of... Uh, kind of cultural sh shift over the, in the past, away from um, women doing, uh, entering careers in science. And um, if you don't feel comfortable with science, maybe you think conservation isn't for me. Besides the fact that now there's a lot of focus on bringing women into the STEM careers, there are lots of ways to enter conservation field with, even if you aren't a science or math person, there's um, a lot to understand about policy, there's data analysis, um, there is um, design. There are design fields that that uh, contribute to conservation work too. So there's a lot of different angles, um, but you definitely have to, you know. I I think passion can kind of get helps you get over a lot of these potential barriers. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And how do we engage the next generation of women? Um, well, we, I know me, myself, I feel like it's important to make myself available to mentor, to talk to women, um, be open to answering questions, no matter where people are coming from. Um, I just got sort of a, a random email from someone who graduated from college. It's my same college just two years ago. It's been quite a while since I graduated from college. And she lives in France, but she's in the States and she does management consulting, but she wanted to get into conservation. So I spent you know, 15 minutes on a Zoom call with her. And hopefully that will help, you know, bring another really strong, smart, talented woman into the field. So I think you have to be open to talking and sharing your experiences. Yes, I think mentoring is key. And many organizations and uh, corporations are mentoring their women because it, it still is a struggle to get into some of the leadership roles. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in, many, in many instances, it's still a man's world. So <laughs> mentoring is key. Mentoring yeah. And, is and not being shy. If you're, if you're early in your career, um, you just have to call people and ask about what they do. People love to talk. I mean, people who are positive and love their jobs love to talk about what they do. Yes. And so you shouldn't be shy. Um, you don't, it doesn't have to be a woman that you reach out to. You can reach out to men as mentors as well. Uh, don't feel like just because you don't see somebody who kind of looks like you, that you, you shouldn't feel comfortable reaching out. Uh, so take a chance. Um, uh, but certainly start with someone who might be comfortable. Yes. Very good advice. We, we need to uh, ask good men uh, for uh, mentoring as well. Thank you for exactly. sharing that. And lastly, what first drew you to conservation and environmentalism as a career path? Hmm. Um, it's so interesting. I really, to me, followed like this straight trajectory. Uh, I think it started with, um, as a child, I was one of three girls, the youngest, and we used to go camping. I mean, not rugged camping. We stayed in a tent tent trailer and my mom cooked meals and had a TV in it. Like it wasn't, wasn't rustic, um, but we spent a lot of time outdoors and I loved it. I loved sort of creating little homes for my stuffed animals in the rocks 
and um, going on hikes with my dad and, and jumping in lakes to go swimming at the end of the day. And I think that just gave me a feeling of comfort, comfort in nature. And then um, I was drawn towards the sciences and I did a few things that I think um, drew me to my current career. I you know, grew up in a city in Baltimore and I went to school in Philadelphia, but I also spent a year on a farm on a kibbutz in Israel. And again, like I just love this idea of having my hands in the dirt, in the soil and growing things that was just really powerful. So um, uh, that in combination, oddly enough, with living in a city led me to kind of ask questions and put things together and specifically drove me to understand how I can bring that sort of love of nature to people who live in cities. Well, thank you very much. And for our listeners, there will be a combination of the originally recorded Q&A and this latest one but not necessarily go, it's, it doesn't have to be black or white. You don't have to study science necessarily. So I'm a banker, actually. I'm by training, I'm in finance. And um, I can now, thankfully, it wasn't this way 25 years ago, but now there's a lot of green finance out there. So you might hear terms like carbon credits or green bonds. Um, there's just a lot going on. So I can be in finance and also be active in the world of kind of environmental, you know, finance. Um, you can, I tell my teenagers as they begin to think about college, you can love the environment, but you can also become a lawyer. You know, you can become a climate change, a lawyer advocating for, you know, um, pollution laws. Or can you imagine having been a lawyer and part of the Flint crisis? So, you know, you can, there is an intersection between law, urban design, architecture, finance, technology, engineering, even art. Um, so I think that, you know, again, for me, it was a passion, a personal passion, but it is possible to kind of mix different things that you're interested and good at. Thank you so much, Catherine. And Jennifer, when people think of conservation or ecological research, they often imagine the countryside or national parks. What about New York's urban environment makes your work so different from the work of those researchers? Uh, the truth is it's not actually that different. <laughs> um, I went to forestry school. I have a master's in forestry and I went to school with people who were there to, to learn and study and work in forests um, all over the world, right? So what you think of a forest, rural forest. Um, but I was always interested in urban forestry. I grew up in Baltimore City. I went to school in Philadelphia. Like that's what mattered to me was about people um, and the environment. And my advisor there who was, um, his expertise was actually in uh, development. He was a sociologist by training and he worked all over the world and he started the Tropical Resource Institute um, at my school. And he fell in love and then, then his like second career was urban forestry and urban natural resources because he realized that you, it's, it's like this little incubator, um, city, city nature and city forest, is, it's like an incubator of new ideas. You see more in a summer in a New York City park than you're going to see in a year in, you know, I don't know, Guanacaste National Park in Puerto Rico because there's a lot of disturbance. These are, this, these are all the same ecological um, concepts that you're going to find anywhere. Disturbance, diversity, um, systems thinking, uh, dealing with native populations, cultural use, um, all those things happen in the city also. So it's an incredible learning environment, regardless of what you want to do for the rest of your life. If you do want to go um, to study something in Madagascar or wherever, it's an amazing learning environment uh, for anybody interested in conservation careers. Thank you so much. Oh. And Catherine, in your work overseas and with the UN, have you noticed different attitudes by different countries, by people of different countries towards environmentalism? Yeah, uh, of course, absolutely. Um, I think that, so, you know, first and foremost, I would say that, uh, of course, um, survival, people's first instinct is for survival. So, you know, if you are very poor, 
farm are living on the edge of a rainforest, you will cut that rainforest down in order to plant a crop such as like a palm, you know, the palm oil tree, and that product feeds into our face creams here in America, right? But you will cut that forest down because you want to survive. So, you know, I want to, you know, preface it with that. It's not that everything is perfect outside of the U.S. That said, though, um, certainly, you know, globally outside of the U.S., there's not really a, a big debate about um, whether climate change is happening and how quickly it's happening and whether it's upon us and whether we have a burden to not just mitigate climate change itself, but actually start, you know, reinventing the way in which we're living. So, you know, I think that's really a big, a big difference. Um, the other thing I would say is that there are parts of the world that really are very, very progressive ahead of the U.S. So, for example, um, Paris announced a couple years back a full ban on fossil fuel cars in Paris by the year 2030. So that's 10 years from now, there will be no more fossil fuel cars allowed in the city of Paris. That's astounding. Um, I think they've also banned all sales of fossil fuel cars by the year 2040. So in 20 years time, diesel and gas cars will not exist in France. That's really powerful. Um, Ireland was the very first country in the world to divest its investments in fossil fuel companies. So, you know, these are things that are happening in other countries um, for a number of reasons. The U.S. is not there. Um, that said, it's not a terrible story. You know, there's a lot of very, very progressive thinking um, on in cities across the U.S. and in certain states. So I think we're not too far behind. But yes, there are, there are big differences. Well, thank you for pointing out that we don't look at the U.S. nationally. We look at what's happening locally because the the federal government has that diverse uh, diversity of power uh, among the states and the cities. So thanks for pointing out that there is hope in our country. Yeah. And if I could just add, you know, the some people may have heard like the Parrot, you know, Climate Accord and the U.S. of course backed out of it. But as soon as the U.S. federally backed out of it, uh, cities across America signed on to it. So, you know, New York City being one of them. Thank you. That's very valuable information. And Jennifer, how closely does New York City Parks collaborate with New York State and federal conservation efforts? Um, we definitely collaborate with them. Um, there are, first of all, there are regulators, right? So they set standards that we have to follow. Uh, so that works best if we're in conversation with them as opposed to sort of uh, oppositional um, and that's really that that's helpful um, they also if you can they're also uh, uh, landowners in New York City right so there's federal property federal parks and state parks and um, birds don't know the difference between property owners uh, or or invasive species so we really do have to work with all of these partners together to approach some very challenging uh, issues that we have in New York City. Uh, for example, an invasive species like kudzu, which you've heard of, um, maybe if you came from the South, it's a very Southern species and we're starting to see it in New York City. Very little bit, it's not coming quickly, but the state has, um, has a sort of a, a, a strike team and they'll come in and if we help identify where they are, they actually can work on sort of private property and other kinds of property that we can't do in the city and they'll help remove it. And then we'll tell them where we have it and we're seeing it and we sort of work together to make sure we have an approach to, to manage that together. Thank you so much. Yeah. So this question is for both of you. I'll ask Catherine to answer first. How have your organization's responsibilities and priorities changed due to COVID-19? How has the environmental focus changed due to COVID-19? Um, you know, really quickly, it's a great question. Really quickly, um, mostly good news. Um, uh, we have seen in our, my neighborhood here in Northeast Queens, uh, market increase in the number of people out and about. Um, 
just enjoying walking. Um, we have a you know small park nearby, walking in the park, certainly walking along the shoreline um, where we are. Uh, there's a lot, there were a lot of fishermen out, so men out um, in the bay, uh, not to eat the fish, but just to enjoy it as a pastime. There's kayakers. It's been a really wonderful thing seeing people, New Yorkers, find outdoor space to get some fresh air, some sunshine. Um, I think in part some of that was because many businesses were closed, so we really saw that uptick then. There is a negative. There is a lot of garbage. We have some garbage issues where people are, you know, out and about during the day. Um, there are teenagers who hang out at night and leave a lot of rubbish around. So I think we we have to do things to address that. Um, we've also seen incredible um, wildlife. So I will say that there was a deer in our neighborhood about three weeks ago, which was crazy. I don't know how uh, he or she got there, um, but we've seen really some amazing wildlife and we've gotten lots of pictures from people. Um, not that the wildlife weren't already there, but people are noticing things more. So um, I, I think uh, I think so far, you know, it's been good. And obviously we can enjoy, we can still do the things that we do because they are outdoor activities. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah. Jennifer? Um, I mean, for our actual jobs, um, managing um, the parks, we really had to think about how to pivot away from our offices, obviously, how to do field work safely. Um, and so I think we've, we've done a good job. It doesn't change what we do. It's more about how we do it. And similar to what Catherine's saying, we're seeing people use natural areas much more than they used to. Uh, I mentioned our par partner, the Natural Areas Conservancy. They did a, a survey of, of um, parks departments around the country, including ours, to kind of uh, demonstrate this trend is true. Uh, there, they were just actually there's a Times article about that a couple of days ago. Um, and what's kind of interesting and something I'd love to understand more is that uh, several years ago, our partners NEC worked with the U.S. Forest Service to survey people and to understand how they use natural areas, who use them, what they were out there for. And one thing that they found is that women in general use them less because they had, uh, um, you know, sort of there was a sense of fear, right? They felt they didn't feel safe. And I'm, I'd love to find out if that's changed at all, because part of the, I think that sense of safety has to do with feeling ice. Well, few things, feeling unfamiliar and feeling isolated. And so I wonder if the greater use of some of these natural areas helps uh, you know, address either of those things because they become more familiar, so you're more comfortable, and there are more people out there. Uh, so I think that's an important thing to kind of look at. How do we make women feel safe in nature in New York City? And curious to see if anything, any results of COVID changes that dynamic. It's a very interesting point. And mm -hmm. so sad if, if women are not enjoying nature because of fear. So yeah. I hope it has changed because of COVID. Yeah. and more people will use the spaces. Uh, just yesterday, I listened to a segment on WNYC uh, NPR local radio, and um, someone from the Delaware area spoke about the uh, increased use of the Delaware River during COVID, mm -hmm. and what it brought was lots of garbage, as you both stated. So what, what the uh, local activists said there, that neighbors, uh, citizens, are cleaning up every day after these visitors, and they're taking it upon themselves. It's a natural space. There aren't trash cans lined along the river. It's a natural space. So we all have to educate our children, our families, start there, that natural spaces will remain natural if whatever we take to them, we bring back home with us and discard it properly. So we have to respect our natural spaces. And for those who need to be taught, well, then it's on all of us to teach those who don't know better. Yeah. We One really thing I like to talk, I like to remind people is, is the connectivity of things. Again, like in the city, it's so easy to draw the lines and boundaries. Like here's a road, here's a house, here's a yard, that's the park. But really, it's all connected. So the garbage that's, you know, in front of your house or on the street is going to end up in the waterways um, and that impacts wildlife. And, um, and so what we can do, it, it, just those little things like picking up trash has an impact down the road, you know, downstream, literally and figuratively. 
Uh, and thinking about those connections are really just really important. I think it's just um, it's how people build community, right? If you think about it in terms of personal connections, um, but it's also really comes from the concept of the natural world that things are all connected. It builds on each other. So true. Thank you for that. And I'd like to go back to the uh, PowerPoint slide for a moment. Um, I'll just note there is a question that I did. I, I answered one question about visiting Fort Taunton, our, our facility in the Q&A or chat. And there's another question about opportunities for youth that I didn't respond to. Um, you know, the on a normal year, oh, I also didn't mention that the financial um, impacts of COVID are really going to be more long lasting than any of these other potentially positive things, you know, so our budget, you know, the New York City budget is really in a, in a very bleak situation right now. And that's going to change our ability to be able to do all those amazing things I talked about. Um, and, and anyway, in a normal year, there are a lot of opportunities for youth to become involved in the summer, summer youth employment program. We, we sponsor a host of them. There's often like sort of conservation core programs. I know there's one in Van Cortlandt Park, and I'm sure there's some in Queens as well and Staten Island. Um, and our partners, again, the NAC, they have internships for CUNY students specifically, and they did do that this year. They have 15 students doing virtual internships. They're still getting paid, uh, and there's always volunteer opportunities. So, Thank important. you for sharing that. If I could actually just add on to that. Um, so I think that's a really good question when we think about our youth, and I have um, two you know, high school uh, kids as well on their way to you know, applying for college. And um, when I spoke about citizen science activities, um, it really, really can be an amazing opportunity for young people to, and it is, you know, unpaid. So these are the not paid positions, but um, it can be a great way for young people to find some other ways of building up their CV, um, their resume in interesting ways. And I'm going to put it right out there. Um, the SAT got canceled. You know, my, my rising senior was supposed to take the SAT in May and June, and both, uh, both sessions were canceled. So colleges have gone, you know, no SAT applications now. What they're looking at is not just your, your classroom grades, but now other things, you know. So how do you find other ways of expressing your passion? And as I said, you know, taking maybe an intellectual interest in something and demonstrating that you've kind of gone out and advocated and been an ally on a particular issue. So these citizen science opportunities, if youth, young people have the time to do that, um, can be a really interesting way, particularly now that the SATs are gone. Right. Or temporarily gone. Yeah, so no excuse. Uh, they can spend time on science. That's a great suggestion. I would like to move on to resources that we've gathered. So uh, Catherine spoke about the Billion Oyster Project and other projects. And uh, so if you want to know more about that, we have in the um, PDF that's available on our website, uh, we have the links. And we have the link to the New York Restoration Project that was mentioned, uh, Green Schools Alliance, Sierra Club New York City, New York City Audubon, New York City Nature Goal 2050, as Jennifer uh, was uh, directing us to to visit. And uh, for election season, check out New York League of Conservation Voters. So we, our vote also counts toward conservation issues. And if you're interested in urban gardening, please do visit the Urban Garden Center, nyc.com, and uh, grownewyorkcity.org slash greenspace. And uh, there's a uh, a PDF with advice on gardening with New York City native plants available at naturalareasnewyorkcity.org. And again, all of this is in the PowerPoint on our website. And now at the Center for the Women of New York, we do want to make the point that women's rights and the environment are important, that women are directly affected by environmental changes. So please do visit wedo.org uh, with regard to women's environment and development organization. 
and a reading list on women and climate change at the YaleClimateConnections.org. And two of these uh, top choices on their reading list, Why Women Will Save the Planet, Friends of the Earth and Gender and the Environment by Nicole Detraz. And uh, we also have a link, Women's Rights Make a Difference for the Environment and Sustainability at IUCN.org and how rising temperatures due to climate change are shortening pregnancies. That is a direct impact on women at time.com. And again, uh, do read Women, Gender, Equality, and Climate Change. The threats of climate change are not gender neutral at un.org slash womenwatch. And again, these links are on our PowerPoint. And then women are directly affected by man-made and natural disasters. So if you'd like to read more on the Flint water crisis that Catherine spoke about, the link is here at nrdc.org. And at npr.org, uh, you can read more about the Flint water crisis. And Women's Media Center as well. And nwlc.org also has the Flint water crisis is a feminist issue. And if you would like to read about uh, how Hurricane Maria put a disproportionate burden on women at um, worldvision.org and at oxfamamerica.org and also on uh, the 2004 Asian tsunami uh, you can read more about how natural disasters uh, and gender inequalities uh, came about there through the 2004 tsunami and the case study of India uh, from jstor.org. So thank you all for attending. Uh, do visit uh, cwny.org if you would like to uh, make sure these educational programs continue. We have uh, a cwn.org slash donations slash, or if you'd like to become a member and support us that way, cwny.org slash membership slash. And uh, please do take care of our environment and thank you for joining us.